the thing about the IPCC and what I kind of understand is that it's a pretty conservative report. And even for as conservative as it is, it's still quite dire. Um, what is your opinion on that report? What, what do you make of the comparisons between 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade in temperature? Um, well, uh, I, I would echo what you just said. I've written about how the IPCC, and this is even coming from people who are authors of IPCC reports and studies, and their main climate assessments come out every seven years. Um, the thing about this report that I think people need to understand that as, as alarming and dire as it is, that there's nothing new in it. Uh, they didn't generate any new information. They basically just took what they already had and put it together in a way to try to resound the alarm that they had hoped previous reports had sounded, which is the absolute necessity to try to aim to limit warming to 1.5 C as opposed to 2 C or 4 C, which is the trajectory we're currently on, because there is a massive, massive difference in global implications between 1.5 C warming and 2 C warming, as you just read. So as dire as those are, I just want to reiterate that um, this is basically um, science by committee, if you will, in the, the IPCC. This is very old data. Some of it's more than 10 years old that they're using to make these projections and assessments. And then when they take all that data into their reports, it's an extremely politicized body. So when you have a country like the United States is going to come in and of course lobby with everything they're worth to go with the least severe uh, ramifications of this data instead of really showing um, what, what could happen and war warning against the worst case scenario. And this is why specifically every IPCC assessment that's come out, um, reality has actually outpaced its worst case future projections. So as we catch up with what they had projected for the year 2000 or the year 2010 or coming up to 2020, we're actually ahead of all their previous worst case projections. And that's a trend that I, I fully expect us to continue into the future. And not just me, but some of the authors of IPCC, IPCC reports whom I've interviewed. Right. And something they mentioned in this, uh, just the part that I quoted here, they discuss in uh, an Arctic, uh, an ice-free Arctic. And um, from what I could tell, just based on the graphs that come out every year, uh, the sea ice extent just diminishes um, pretty dramatically. Um, could you please explain um, the significance, I, I guess maybe to frame this, using the term canary in the coal mine, right? Something that's really sounding the alarm that we should really use as an indication that uh, the climate is radically changing. The Arctic is a very good example. Um, if you could please discuss the danger of having a uh, little to no ice in the Arctic region, be great. Well, we, we are on track. The most recent graphs that we have, including data from this year show the, the current projection is that uh, we're set up to start having ice-free periods in the summer of Arctic sea ice uh, within about five years from right now. Um, and, and it could be sooner, but the current projections, looking at trends and, and minimum extents and minimum volumes, et cetera, show it to be happening, beginning to happen within five years from right now. Um, what why so many people are fixated on Arctic sea ice, myself included, is because <clears throat> there's there's several very, very worrisome things that are set to happen once that's gone. And we're already actually seeing them start to happen, but that they, they will only accelerate when there's periods of no Arctic sea ice in the summer. The first and most important, I feel, is that that sea ice is basically reflecting back sunlight and the heat with it uh, from... Um, going down into the water and getting into the shallow seas and warming them up to a point where the um, massive amounts of methane hydrates that are frozen into that subsea permafrost. Once that starts melting and those get released, methane is a hundred times more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide on a 10 year time scale. And it's still 20 times as potent on a hundred year time scale. And once that methane starts getting released on moss, then 
we're essentially replicating the key extinction driver during the Permian mass extinction 252 million years ago, which wiped out 90% of all life on Earth, most of it in the oceans. And we are, as I said, on track to replicating that. Even this summer, uh, we've seen lakes now in the Arctic that are literally bubbling because permafrost underneath them is melting and releasing methane that's coming up through the water. Other areas in subsea, we're already seeing releases. This has actually been happening for several years now, but it's now accelerating. So for this to happen across the Arctic, and especially once we have that sea ice completely gone for periods during the summer, then we're at grave risk of that happening all across the shallow seas of the Arctic. So that's number one. Number two, it shifts weather patterns globally, and it's also causing uh, things like, you know, as Greenland melts, and as that steady trend of overall melting in Greenland is, is continuing, of course, it vacillates year to year, but overall we see a consistent downward trend as far as, well, as far as increasing melting uh, with Greenland. And then that's causing a disruption of the Atlantic Mariel Dianal Ocean Circulation Current, the AMOC, which is a giant circulating current uh, from the Atlantic. And as that slows down, that is going to affect weather patterns dramatically, particularly in um, northwestern Europe and, and northern Europe. Uh, so, so there's going to be major weather pattern shifts. And along with that comes um, rainfall patterns shifting across the globe. So food, food supplies are going to be impacted, et cetera. And, and that's still a very cursory glance, but that gives you an idea of how important it is that the sea ice uh, remain intact and the unfortunate reality that we're looking at is that it is on its way out. And the things that I described are uh, appearing to be inevitable. Um, it, it's just, I think it's just a question of when. Right, it is a question of when, but it does seem like this is, a, this is coming up within our lifetimes. You know, oftentimes we project this out into, oh, this is 2100, or this is gonna be our grandchildren that are gonna have to deal with this, uh, this problem. Uh, this is happening right now. This is manifesting right now. I think oftentimes when you read about climate change in any report, in any mainstream publication, it's projected into the future. Uh, but we're starting to see those effects play out in the present. I mean, we have wild, wildfires that are breaking records every year here in the, nor in the uh, North American continent. Um, we're seeing wildfires up in the Arctic uh, circle. Is that right? That's right. And that's, um, I, I guess maybe to point on this, I think we, we as human beings have a hard time cognitively understanding uh, exponential change or nonlinear change. Uh, we tend to think very linear, linearly about these things, like it's going to gradually warm, things are gradually going to change, we're going to have gradual sea rise. Um, that's how we, in an evolutionary sense, understand this information. Um, but what is disturbing is that we are, we are not cognitively capable, it seems, um, at least initially, uh, to understand the very rapid change that is happening and how quickly that's going to cause massive societal change, um, you know, collapse of infrastructure, the inability to get something like food, uh, the way our whole agricultural system, uh, our whole socioeconomic system is structured. Uh, we will not be able to have access to things that we absolutely rely upon like grain, right? Like so much of our food comes from that particular source. Um, yeah, if you just had a comment on, on uh, exponential change and uh, you know, pointing to what we discussed with the Arctic, but like understanding how rapidly this is going to play out. Um, if you can give us some kind of understanding of that, that'd be great. I think that's a very important point, and I think I can share a story that will really help illustrate it. Um, um, and I share this with some humility because I thought, given all the research that I do and have done about climate change, for my book for the right for truth out i felt like i had a very deep knowing of yes all these things that we've been talking about in the future they're already starting to happen now i get that um but i didn't i i under something happened actually this summer that kind of underscored that i didn't really get it and i think it's because until something happened directly to me that was 
overtly climate related, that needed to happen for it to sink in. And what happened was I was writing about this. I had done so much research for my book, pulled it all together. And again, I was confronted with a lot of despair and grief and depression. And so I took a couple of days off work. Uh, I, I took some mental health days and I went to go climb a mountain in the Cascades, which late summer Pacific Northwest, one would think um, wildfires and wildfire smoke might not be such a big issue. So I went into the mountains to seek solace. And while I was there, I was going to stay two nights, but, but wildfire smoke from British Columbia and Eastern Washington and Montana was so bad and started coming in so thick, literally billowing in like clouds that I could see. And uh, I've had respiratory problems in the past. I literally, uh, I, I texted uh, a dear friend of mine um, back home in Port Townsend, which is on the water near the coast. And I said, is there any smoke there? Because if not, I'm gonna, I'm gonna bail early on this trip and come home. And she said, nope, it's, it's clear. And so I, I literally had to pack up after the climb and instead of staying the extra night and lounging and enjoying the, the solitude of the mountains and reading a book, I, I, I came home and I drove for three hours west and, and it took almost that entirety of getting all the way basically to just north of Seattle until I emerged back out of the smoke. Um, and, and it really got me, you know, that, that that's what it's like, you know, when the world is burning and, and you're surrounded by smoke everywhere and you have sensitive respiratory condition and you can't afford to be in that. And then I also got how lucky and privileged I am that I could just leave and then go to a place where there wasn't smoke. So that, but that really kind of underscored it for me as well as then knowing that all these people who in California and Oregon, who their, their fires, their, I'm sorry, their houses have burnt down you know, for them, there's nothing theoretical about this anymore. People in Bangladesh, millions of people that as we speak are having to relocate and find ways to move to higher ground because they live on the biggest river delta in the world and it's flooding because of sea level rise and river floods. Um, there's nothing theoretical to them. You know, the wildfires, you know, the people in the panhandle of Florida or in the Carolinas from the hurricanes this summer who've lost everything. There's nothing theoretical in future about it anymore to them. Right. And I think this is kind of the thing. We, we exist, we live here within the United States. It's still technically considered a first world nation, although maybe we're, <laughs> that's changing, uh, it seems. Um, but it seems like the most vulnerable people in the world, the poorest people in the world are the ones that are the, the first to be affected by this. Um, yeah. It's all coming back though. I think, um, was it was it hens coming home to roost? That kind of is that chickens coming coming home to roost? Chickens, yeah. yeah, chickens coming home to roost, and I I really think it is. And and no matter where we live now, um, even even in the so-called bubble that a lot of the U.S. has been for a long time, um, none of us are impervious anymore. And I think with time, that's only going to continue to become that much more dramatically apparent. Dr. Bones, you're live. Can we get a mic check from you? Uh, buy guns, punch fascists in the face, and prepare for the inevitable ecological collapse by making your own lives more beautiful than anything this rotten society could give you. Fuck yeah, you're live. <laughs> okay, beautiful. <laughs>